Chapter Thirteen of Moods. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Laura Riley. Moods by Louisa May Alcott. Chapter Thirteen Sylvia's Honeymoon. It began with a pleasant journey. Day after day they loitered along country roads that led them through many scenes of summer beauty, pausing at old-fashioned inns and wayside farmhouses, or gypsying at noon in some Greek nook where their four-footed comrades dined off their tablecloth while they made merry over the less simple fare their last hostess had provided for them. When the scenery was uninteresting, as was sometimes the case, for nature will not disturb her domestic arrangements for any bridal pair, one or the other read aloud, or both sang, while conversation was a never-failing pastime, and silence had charms which they could enjoy. Sometimes they walked a mile or two, ran down a hillside, rustled through a grain field, strolled onto an orchard, or feasted from fruitful hedges by the way, as carefree as the squirrels on the wall or the jolly brown bees, lunching at the sign of the clover top. They made friends with the sheep in the meadows, cows at the brook, travelers morose or bland, farmers full of a sturdy sense that made their chat as wholesome as the mold which they delved in schoolchildren barefooted and blithe, and specimens of womankind, from the buxom housewife who took them under her motherly wing at once, to the sour, snuffy, shoe-binding spinster with no admittance written all over her face. To more, the world was glorified with the purple light which seldom touches it but once for any of us. The journey was a wedding march, made beautiful by summer, victorious by joy, his young wife the queen of women, and himself an equal of the gods because no longer conscious of a want. Sylvia could not be otherwise than happy, for finding unbounded liberty and love her portion, she had nothing to regret, and regarded marriage as an agreeable process which had simply changed her name and given her protector, friend, and lover all in one. She was therefore her sweetest and sincerest self, miraculously docile and charmingly gay, interested in all she saw, and quite overflowing with delight when the last days of the week betrayed the secret that her destination was the mountains. Loving the sea so well, her few flights from home had given her only marine experiences, and the flavor of entire novelty was added to the feast her husband had provided for her. It came to her not only when she could enjoy it most, but when she needed it most, soothing the unquiet, stimulating the nobler elements which ruled her life by turns, and fitting her for what lay before her choosing the quietest roads, more showed her the wonders of a region whose wild grandeur and beauty make its memory a lifelong satisfaction. Day after day they followed mountain paths, studying the changes of an ever-varying landscape, watching the flush of dawn redden the granite fronts of these titans, scarred with centuries of storm, the luster of noon brood over them, until they smiled. The evening purple wrapped them in its splendor, or moonlight touched them with its magic, till Sylvia, always looking up at that which filled her heart with reverence and awe, was led to look beyond, and through the medium of the friend beside her, learned that human love brings us nearer to the divine, and is the surest means to that great end." The last week of the honeymoon came all too soon, for then they had promised to return. 
The crowning glory of the range was left until the last, and after a day of memorable delights, Sylvia sat in the sunset, feasting her eyes upon the wonders of a scene which is indescribable, for words have limits, and that is apparently illimitable. Presently more came to her, asking, "'Will you join a party to that great ice palace "'and see three acres of snow in August, "'worn by a waterfall into a cathedral, "'as white if not as durable as any marble?' "'I sit so comfortably here, I think I had rather not. "'But you must go because you like such wonders, "'and I shall rest till you come back. "'Then I shall take myself off, and leave you to muse over the pleasures of the day, which for a few hours has made you one of the most eminent women this side of the Rocky Mountains. There is a bugle at the house here, with which to make echoes. I shall take it with me, and from time to time send up a sweet reminder that you are not to stray away and lose yourself. Sylvia sat for half an hour, then wearied by the immensity of the wide landscape, she tried to rest her mind by examining the beauties close at hand. Strolling down the path the sightseers had taken, she found herself in a rocky basin, scooped in the mountainside like a cup for a little pool. So clear and bright it looked a diamond set in jet. A fringe of scanty herbage had collected about its brim, russet mosses, purple heath, and delicate white flowers, like a band of tiny hill people keeping their revels by some fairy well. The spot attracted her, and remembering that she was not to stray away, she sat down beside the path to wait for her husband's return. In the act of bending over the pool to sprinkle the thirsty little company about it, her hand was arrested by the tramp of approaching feet, and looking up to discover who was the disturber of her retreat, she saw a man pausing at the top of the path opposite to that by which she had come. He seemed scrutinizing the solitary occupant of the dell before descending, but as she turned her face to him, he flung away the knapsack, hat, and staff, and then, with a great start, she saw no stranger but Adam Warwick. Coming down to her so joyfully, so impetuously, she had only time to recognize him and cry out when she was swept up in an embrace as tender as irresistible and lay there conscious of nothing but that happiness like some strong, swift angel had wrapped her away into the promised land so long believed in hungered for, and despaired of, as forever lost. Soon she heard his voice, breathless, eager, but so fond it seemed another voice than his. My darling, did you think I should never come? I thought you had forgotten me. I knew you were married. Adam, put me down. But he only held her closer, and laughed such a happy laugh that Sylvia felt the truth before he uttered it. How could I marry, loving you? How could I forget you, even if I had never come to tell you this? Sylvia, I know much that has passed. Geoffrey's failure gave me courage to hope for success, and that the mute betrothal made with a look so long ago had been to you all it has been to me. Adam, you are both right and wrong. You do not know all. Let me tell you, began Sylvia, as these proofs of ignorance brought her to herself with a shock of recollection and dismay. But Warwick was as absolute in his happiness as he had been in his self-denial, and took possession of her mentally as well as physically, with a despotism too welcome and entire to be at once resisted. You shall tell me nothing till I have shown the cause of my hard-seeming silence. I must throw off that burden first. 
Then I will listen to you until morning, if you will. I have earned this moment by a year of effort. Let me keep you here and enjoy it without alloy. The old charm had lost none of its power, for absence seemed to have gifted it with redoubled potency, the confirmation of that early hope to grace it with redoubled warmth. Sylvia let him keep her, feeling that he had earned that small reward for a year's endeavor, resolving to grant all now left to her to bestow, a few moments more of blissful ignorance, than to show him his loss and comfort him, sure that her husband would find no disloyalty in a compassion scarcely less deep and self-forgetful than his own would have been had he shared their secret. Only pausing to place himself upon the seat she left, Warwick put off her hat, and turning her face to his, regarded it with such unfeigned and entire content her wavering purpose was fixed by a single look. Then, as he began to tell the story of the past, she forgot everything but the rapid words she listened to, the countenance she watched. So beautifully changed and softened, it seemed as if she had never seen this man before, or saw him now as we sometimes see familiar figures glorified in dreams. In the fewest, kindest words, Warwick told her of Attila, the promise and the parting. Then, as if the dearer theme deserved less brevity, he lingered on it as one lingers at a friend's door, enjoying in anticipation the welcome he is sure awaits him. The night we walked together by the river, such a wilful yet cunning comrade as I had that day, and how I enjoyed it all. That night I suspected that Geoffrey loved you, Sylvia, and was glad to think it. A month later I was sure of it, and found in that knowledge the great hardship of my life, because I loved you myself. Audacious thing! How dared you steal into my heart! and take possession when I had turned my last guest out, and barred the door. I thought I had done with the sentiment that had so nearly wrecked me once, but see how blind I was, the false love only made me readier for the true. You never seemed like a child to me, Sylvia, because you have an old soul in a young body, and your father's trials and temptations live again in you. This first attracted me. I liked to watch, to question, to study the human enigma to which I had found a clue from its maker's lips. I liked your candor and simplicity, your courage and caprice. Even your faults found favor in my eyes, for pride, will, impetuosity were old friends of mine and I like to see them working in another shape. At first you were a curiosity, then an amusement, then a necessity. I wanted you, not occasionally, but constantly. You put salt and savor into life for me, for whether you spoke or were silent, were sweet or sour, friendly or cold, I was satisfied to feel your nearness, and always took away an inward content which nothing else could give me. This affection was so unlike the other that I deceived myself for a time. Not long. I soon knew what had befallen me, soon felt that this sentiment was good to feel, because I forgot my turbulent and worser self and felt the nobler regenerated by the innocent companionship you gave me. I wanted you, but it was not the touch of hands or lips, the soft encounter of eyes, the tones of tenderness I wanted most. It was that something beyond my reach, vital and vestal, invisible yet irresistible, that something, be it heart, soul, 
or mind which drew me to you by an attraction genial and genuine as itself my sylvia that was love and when it came to me i took it in sure that whether its fruition was granted or denied i should be a manlier man for having harbored it even for an hour why turn your face away well hide it if you will but lean here as you did once so long ago she let him lay it on his shoulder still feeling that moore was one to look below the surface of these things and own that she did well in giving so pure a love a happy moment before its death as she would have cherished warwick had he laid dying on that september evening as i sat alone i had been thinking of what might be and what must be had decided that i would go away for geoffrey's sake he was fitter than i to have you being so gentle and in all ways ready to possess a wife i was so rough such a vagrant so full of my own purposes and plans how could i dare to take into my keeping such a tender little creature as yourself i thought you did not care for me i knew any knowledge of my love would only mar his own so it was best to go at once and leave him to the happiness he so well deserved just then you came to me as if the wind had blown my desire to my arms such a loving touch that was it nearly melted my resolve it seemed hard not to take the one thing i wanted when it came to me so opportunely i yearned to break that idle promise made when i was vain in my own conceit and justly punished for its folly but you said keep it and i did you could not understand my trouble and when i sat before you so still perhaps looking grim and cold you did not know how i was wrestling with my unruly self i am not truly generous for the relinquishment of any cherished object always costs a battle and i too often find i am worsted for the first time i dared not meet your eyes till you dived into mine with that expression wistful and guileless which has often made me feel as if we stood divested of our bodies soul to soul tongue i could control heart i could not up it sprung stronger than will swifter than thought and answered you sylvia had there been one ray of self-consciousness in those steady eyes of yours one atom of maiden shame or fear or trouble i should have claimed you as my own there was not and though you let me read your face like an open book you never dreamed what eloquence was in it innocent heart that loved and had not learned to know it i saw this instantly saw that a few more such encounters would show it to you likewise and felt more strongly than before that if ever the just deed to you the generous one to geoffrey were done it should be then for that was the one moment when your half-awakened heart could fall painlessly asleep again if i did not disturb it and dream on till geoffrey woke it to find a gentler master than i could be to it it could not adam you had wholly roused it and it cried for you so long so bitterly oh why did you not come to answer it before how could i till the year was over was i not obeying you in keeping that accursed promise god knows i have made many blunders but i think the most senseless was that promise the most short-sighted that belief what right had i to fetter my tongue or try to govern love shall i ever learn to do my own work aright and not meddle with the lord's sylvia take this presumptuous and domineering devil out of me in time lest i blunder as blindly after you are mine as i have before 
Now let me finish before Mark comes to find us. I went away, you know, singing the farewell I dared not speak, and for nine months kept myself sane and steady with whatever my hands found to do. If ever work of mine is blessed, it will be that, for into it I put the best endeavor of my life. Though I had renounced you, I kept my love, let it burn day and night, fed it with labor and with prayer, trusting that this selfish heart of mine might be recast and made a fitter receptacle for an enduring treasure. In May, far at the west, I met a woman who knew Geoffrey, had seen him lately, and learned that he had lost you. She was his cousin, I his friend, and through our mutual interest in him this confidence naturally came about. When she told me this, hope blazed up, and all manner of wild fancies haunted me. Love is arrogant, and I nourished a belief that even I might succeed where Geoffrey failed. You were so young, you were not likely to be easily won by any other, if such a man had asked in vain, and a conviction gradually took possession of me that you had understood, had loved, and were yet waiting for me. A month seemed like an eternity to wait, but I left myself no moment for despair, and soon turned my face to Cuba, finding renewed hope on the way. Gabriel went with me, told me how Attila had searched for me, and failing to find me, had gone back to make ready for my coming. How she had tried to be all I desired, and how unworthy I was of her. This was well, but the mention of your name was better, and much close questioning gave me the scene which he remembered, because Attila had chidden him sharply for his disclosures to yourself. Knowing you so well, I gathered much from trifles which were nothing in Gabriel's eyes. I felt that regard for me, if nothing warmer, had prompted your interest in them, and out of the facts given me by faith and Gabriel, I built myself a home, which I have inhabited as a guest till now, when I know myself its master, and welcome its dear mistress, so my darling. He bent to give her a tender greeting, but Sylvia arrested him. Not yet, Adam, not yet. Go on, before it is too late to tell me as you wish. He thought it was some maidenly scruple, and though he smiled at it, he respected it, for this same coyness in the midst of all her whims had always been one of her attractions in his eye. Shy thing, I will tame you yet, and draw you to me as confidingly as I drew the bird to hop into my hand and eat. You must not fear me, Sylvia, else I shall grow tyrannical, for I hate fear, and like to trample on whatever dares not fill its place bravely, sure that it will receive its due as trustfully as these little mosses sit among the clouds and find a spring to feed them even in the rock. Now I will make a speedy end of this, pleasant as it is to sit here, feeling myself no longer a solitary waif. I shall spare you the stormy scenes I passed through with Attila, because I do not care to think of my Cleopatra while I hold my fine spirit Ariel in my arms. She had done her best, but had I been still heart-free, I never could have married her. She is one of those tameless natures which only God can govern. I dared not, even when I thought I loved her, for much as I love power, I love truth more. I told her this, heard prayers, reproaches, threats, and denunciations, tried to leave her kindly, and then was ready for my fate with you. But I was not to have my will so easily. I had fallen into the net, and was not to leave it till the scourging had been given. So like that other wandering Christian, 
I cried out, submitted, and was the meeker for it. I had to wait a little before the ship sailed. I would not stay at El Labyrintha, Gabriel's home, for Attila was there, and though the fever raged at Havana, I felt secure in my hitherto unbroken health. I returned there and paid the penalty, for weeks of suffering taught me that I could not trifle with this body of mine, sturdy as it seemed. Oh, Adam, who took care of you? Where did you lie and suffer all that time? Never fret yourself concerning that. I was not neglected. A sister of the Sacred Heart took excellent care of me, and a hospital is as good as a palace when one neither knows nor cares where he is. It went hardly with me, I believe, but being resolved to live, I fought it through. Death looked at me, had compassion, and passed me by. There is a Haitian proverb which must comfort you if I am a gaunt ghost of my former self. A lean free man is better than a fat slave. There comes the first smile I have seen, but my next bit of news will bring a frown, I think. When I was well enough to creep out, I learned that Attila was married. You heard the rumor, doubtless, but not the name, for Gabriel's and mine were curiously blended in many minds by the suddenness of my disappearance and his appearance as the bridegroom. It was like her. She had prepared for me, as if sure I was to fill the place I had left, hoping that this confidence of hers would have its due effect upon me. It did try me sorely, but an experience once over is as if it had never been, as far as regret or indecision is concerned. Therefore, wedding gowns and imperious women failed to move me. To be left a groomless bride stung that fiery pride of hers more than many an actual shame or sin would have done. People would pity her, would see her loss, deride her for her willful folly. Gabriel loved her as she desired to be loved, blindly and passionately. Few knew of our later bond, many of our betrothal. Why not let the world believe me the rejected party come back for a last appeal? I had avoided all whom I once knew, for I loathed the place, no one had discovered me at the hospital. She thought me gone. She boldly took the step, married the poor boy, left Cuba before I was myself again, and won herself an empty victory which I never shall disturb. How strange! Yet I can believe it of her. She looked a woman who would dare do anything. Then you came back, Adam, to find me? What led you here, hoping so much and knowing so little? Did you ever know me to do anything in the accustomed way? Do I not always aim straight at the thing I want, and pursue it by the shortest road? It fails often, and I go back to the slower, surer way, but my own is always tried first, as involuntarily as I hurled myself down that slope, as if storming a fort, instead of meeting my sweetheart. That is a pretty old word, beloved of better men than I, so let me use it once. Among the first persons I met on landing was a friend of your father's. He was just driving away in hot haste, but catching a glimpse of the familiar face, I bethought me that it was the season for summer travel. You might be away, and no one else would satisfy me. He might know, and time be saved. I asked one question. Where are the Yules? He answered as he vanished. The young people are all at the mountains. That was enough, and congratulating myself on the forethought, which would save me some hundred miles of needless delay, away I went, and for days have been searching for you everywhere on that side of the hills, which I know so well but no Yules had passed. 
and feeling sure you were on this side, I came, not around, but straight over, for this seemed a royal road to my love, and here I found her waiting for me by the way. Now, Sylvia, are your doubts all answered, your fears all laid, your heart at rest on mine? As the time drew nearer, Sylvia's task daunted her. Warwick was so confident, so glad and tender over her, it seemed like pronouncing the death doom to say those hard words, It is too late. While she struggled to find some expression that should tell all kindly, yet entirely, Adam, seeming to read some hint of her trouble, asked, with that gentleness which now overlaid his former abruptness, and was the more alluring for the contrast. Have I been too arrogant a lover, too sure of happiness, too blind to my small deserts? Sylvia, have I misunderstood the greeting you have given me? Yes, Adam, utterly. He knit his brows, his eyes grew anxious, his content seemed rudely broken, but still hopefully he said, You mean that absence has changed you, that you do not love me as you did, and pity made you kind? Well, I receive the disappointment, but I do not relinquish my desire. What has been, may be. Let me try again to earn you. Teach me to be humble, patient, all that I should be to make myself more dear to you. Something disturbs you. Be frank with me. I have shown you all my heart. What have you to show me in return? Only this. She freed herself entirely from his hold and held up her hand before him. He did not see the ring. He thought she gave him all he asked, and with a glow of gratitude extended both his own to take it. Then she saw that delay was worse than weak, and though she trembled, she spoke out bravely, ending his suspense at once. Adam, I do not love you as I did, nor can I wish or try to bring it back, because I am married. He sprung up as if shot through the heart, nor could a veritable bullet from her hand have daunted him with a more intense dismay than those three words. An instant's incredulity, then conviction, came to him, and he met it like a man, for though his face whitened and his eye burned with an expression that wrung her heart, he demanded, steadily, To whom? This was the hardest question of all, for well she knew the name would wound the deeper for its dearness, and while it lingered pitifully upon her lips, its owner answered for himself. Clear and sweet came up the music of the horn, bringing them a familiar air they all loved, and had often sung together. Warwick knew it instantly, felt the hard truth but rebelled against it, and put out his arm as if to ward it off as he exclaimed, with real anguish in countenance and voice, "'Oh, Sylvia, it is not Geoffrey. Yes. Then, as if all strength had gone out of her, she dropped down upon the mossy margin of the spring and covered up her face, feeling that the first sharpness of a pain like this was not for human eye to witness. How many minutes passed she could not tell. The stillness of the spot remained unbroken by any sound but the whisper of the wind, and in this silence Sylvia found time to marvel at the calmness which came to her. Self had been forgotten in surprise and sympathy, and still her one thought was how to comfort Warwick. She had expected some outburst of feeling, some gust of anger or despair, but neither sigh nor sob, reproach nor regret, reached her, and soon she stole an anxious glance to see how it went with him. He was standing where she left him, both hands locked together till they were white with the passionate pressure, his eyes fixed on some distant object with a regard as imploring as unseeing, 
and through those windows of the soul he looked out darkly, not despairingly, but as if sure that somewhere there was help for him, and he waited for it with a stern patience more terrible to watch than the most tempestuous grief. Sylvia could not bear it, and remembering that her confession had not yet been made, seized that instant for the purpose, prompted by an instinct which assured her that the knowledge of her pain would help him to bear his own. She told him all, and ended, saying, Now, Adam, come to me and let me try to comfort you. Sylvia was right, for through the sorrowful bewilderment that brought a brief eclipse of hope and courage, sympathy reached him like a friendly hand to uphold him till he found the light again. While speaking, she had seen the immobility that frightened her break-up, and Warwick's whole face flush and quiver with the rush of emotions controllable no longer. But the demonstration which followed was one she had never thought to see from him, for when she stretched her hands to him with that tender invitation, she saw the deep eyes fill and overflow. Then he threw himself down before her, and for the first time in her short life, showed her that sad type of human suffering, a man weeping like a woman. Warwick was one of those whose passions, as his virtues, were in unison with the powerful body they inhabited, and in such a crisis as the present, but one of two reliefs were possible to him, either wrathful denunciation, expostulation, and despair, or the abandon of a child. Against the former, he had been struggling dumbly till Sylvia's words had turned the tide, and too entirely natural to feel a touch of shame at that which is not a weakness but a strength, too wise to reject so safe an outlet for so dangerous a grief, he yielded to it, letting the merciful magic of tears quench the fire, wash the first bitterness away, and leave reproaches only writ in water. It was better so, and Sylvia acknowledged it within herself, as she sat mute and motionless, softly touching the brown hair scattered on the moss, her poor consolation silenced by the pathos of the sight, while through it all rose and fell the fitful echo of the horn, in very truth a sweet reminder not to stray away and lose herself. An hour ago it would have been a welcome sound, for peak after peak gave back the strain, and airy voices whispered it until the faintest murmur died. But now she let it soar and sigh half heard, for audible to her alone still came its sad accompaniment of bitter human tears. To Warwick it was far more, for music, the comforter, laid her balm on his sore heart as no mortal pity could have done, and wrought the miracle which changed the friend who seemed to have robbed him of his love to an unconscious Orpheus who subdued the savage and harmonized the man. Soon he was himself again, for to those who harbor the strong virtues with patient zeal, no lasting ill can come, no affliction can wholly crush, no temptation wholly vanquish. He rose with eyes the clearer for their stormy reign, twice a man for having dared to be a child again, humbler and happier for the knowledge that neither vain resentment nor unjust accusation had defrauded of its dignity the heavy hour that left him desolate but not degraded. I am comforted, Sylvia, rest assured of that. And now there is little more to say, but one thing to do. I shall not see your husband yet, and leave you to tell him what seems best, for, with the instinct of an animal, I always go away to outlive my hurts alone. But remember that I acquit you of blame, and believe that I will yet be happy in your happiness. I know if Geoffrey were here, he would let me do this, because he has suffered as I suffer now. Bending, he gathered her to an embrace as different 
from that other as despair is from delight, and while he held her there, crowding into one short minute all the pain and passion of a year, she heard a low but exceeding bitter cry. Oh, my Sylvia, it is hard to give you up. Then, with the solemn satisfaction which assured her as it did himself, he spoke out clear and loud. Thank God for the merciful hereafter, in which we may retrieve the blunders we make here. With that he left her, never turning till the burden so joyfully cast down had been resumed. Then, staff and hat in hand, he paused on the margin of that granite cup, to him a cup of sorrow, and looked into its depths again. Clouds were trooping eastward, but in that pause the sun glanced full on Warwick's figure, lifting his powerful head into a flood of light, as he waved his hand to Sylvia with a gesture of courage and good cheer. The look, the act, the memories they brought her, made her heart ache with a sharper pang than pity, and filled her eyes with tears of impotent regret as she turned her head as if to chide the blithe clamor of the horn. When she looked again, the figure and the sunshine were both gone, leaving her alone and in the shadow. End of chapter 13 Read by Laura Riley Chapter 14 of Moods. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Corinne LePage. Moods by Louisa May Alcott. Chapter 14 A Fireside Fete. No cousin Faith tonight. The rain has prevented her from taking this boat, and she is not likely to come later as she comes alone, said Moore, returning from a fruitless drive to meet his expected guest one October evening. It always rains when I want anything very much. I seem to have a great deal of bad weather in my life, answered Sylvia despondingly. Never mind the rain. Let us make sunshine for ourselves and forget it as children do. I wish I was a child again. They are always happy. Let us play at being children, then. Let us sit down upon the rug, parch corn, crack nuts, roast apples, and be merry in spite of wind and weather. Sylvia's face brightened, for the fancy pleased her, and she wanted something new and pleasant to divert her thoughts from herself. Glancing at her dress, which was unusually matronly in honor of the occasion, she said, smiling, I don't look much like a child but I should like to try and feel like one again if I can. Let us both look and feel so as much as possible. You like masquerading? Go make a little girl of yourself, while I turn boy and prepare for our merrymaking. No lad could have spoken with a blither face, for Moore had preserved much of the boy in spite of his thirty years. His cheerfulness was so infectious that Sylvia already began to forget her gloom, and hurried away to do her part putting on a short girlish gown kept for scrambles among the rocks she improvised a pinafore and braided her long hair a la morlena kenwigs with butterfly bows at the ends when she went down she found her husband in garden jacket collar turned over a ribbon hair in a curly tumble and a jackknife in hand seated on the rug before a roaring fire and a semicircle of apples whittling and whistling like a very boy they examined one another with mirthful commendations, and Moore began his part by saying, "'Isn't this jolly? Now come and cuddle down here beside me and see which will keep it up the longest.' "'What would Prue say? And who would recognize this elegant Mr. Moore and this big boy? Putting dignity and broadcloth aside makes you look about eighteen and very charming, I find you,' said Sylvia, looking about twelve herself, and also very charming." Here is a wooden fork for you to tend the roast with, while I see to the corn laws and prepare a vegetable snowstorm. What will you have, little girl? You look as if you wanted something. I was only thinking that I should have a doll to match your knife, 
I feel as if I should enjoy trotting a staring fright on my knee and singing hush a -bye. but I fancy even your magic cannot produce such a thing, can it, my lad? In exactly five minutes a lovely doll will appear, though such a thing has not been seen in my bachelor establishment for years. With which mysterious announcement Moore ran off, blundering over the ottomans and slamming the doors as a true boy should, Sylvia pricked chestnuts and began to forget her bosom trouble as she wondered what would appear with the impatient curiosity appropriate to the character she had assumed. Presently her husband reappeared with much breeziness of aspect, raindrops in his hair and a squirming bundle in his arms. Triumphantly unfolding many wraps, he displayed little Tilly in her nightgown. "'There is a sorcery for you, and a doll worth having, being one of the sort that can shut its eyes. It was going to bed, but its mamma relented and lends it to us for the night. I told Mrs. Dodd you wanted her and couldn't wait. So she sent her clothes, but the room is so warm, let the dear play in her pretty bedgown.' Sylvia received her lovely plaything with enthusiasm, and Tilly felt herself suddenly transported to a baby's paradise— where beds were unknown, and fruit and freedom were her welcome portion. Merrily popped the corn, nimbly danced the nuts upon the shovel, lustily remonstrated the rosy martyrs on the hearth, and cheerfully the minutes slipped away. Sylvia sung every jubilant air she knew, Moore whistled astonishing accompaniments, and Tilly danced over the carpet with nutshells on her toes, and tried to fill her little gown with pity flowers from its garlands and bouquets. Without the wind lamented, the sky wept, and the sea thundered on the shore, but within, youth, innocence, and love held their blithe revel undisturbed. "'How are the spirits now?' asked one playmate of the other. "'Quite merry, thank you, and I should think I was little Sylvia again but for the sight of this.' She held up the hand that wore a single ornament, but the hand had grown so slender since it was first put on, that the ring would have fallen had she not caught it at her fingertip. There was nothing of the boy in her companion's face, as he said, with an anxious look. "'If you go thinning so fast, I shall begin to fear that the little wife is not happy with her old husband. Is she, dear?' "'She would be a most ungrateful woman if she were not. I always get thin as winter comes on. But I'm so careless, I'll find a guard for my ring tomorrow.' No need to wait till then. Wear this to please me, and let Marion's cipher signify that you are mine. With a gravity that touched her more than the bestowal of so dear a relic, Moore unslung a signet ring from his watchguard, and with some difficulty pressed it to its place on Sylvia's finger, a most effectual keeper for that other ring, whose tenure seemed so slight. She shrunk a little and glanced up at him, because his touch was more firm than tender, and his face wore a masterful expression seldom seen there, for instinct, subtler than perception, prompted both act and aspect. Then her eye fell and fixed upon the dark stone with the single letter engraved upon its tiny oval, and to her it took a double significance as her husband held it there, claiming her again with that emphatic, mine. She did not speak, but something in her manner caused the fold between his brows to smooth itself away as he regarded the small hand lying passively in his, and said, half playfully, half earnestly, "'Forgive me if I hurt you, but you know my wooing is not over yet. Until you love me with a perfect love, I cannot feel that my wife is wholly mine. I am so young, you know. When I am a woman grown, I can give you a woman's love.' Now it is a girl's, you say. Wait for me, Geoffrey, a little longer, for indeed I do my best to be all you would have me. Something brought tears into her eyes and made her lips tremble, but in a breath the smile came back and she added gaily, How can I help being grave sometimes and getting thin with so many housekeeping cares upon my shoulder and such an exacting, tyrannical husband to wear upon my nerves? Don't I look like the most miserable of wives? She did not certainly as she shook the pauper laughingly, and looked over her shoulder at him, with the bloom of firelight on her cheeks, its cheerfulness in her eyes. Keep that expression for every day wear, and I am satisfied. I want no tame Griselda, but the little girl who once said she was always happy with me. Assure me of that, and having won my Leah, 
I can work and wait still longer for my Rachel. Bless the baby, what has she done with herself now? Tilly had retired behind the sofa, after she had swarmed over every chair and couch, examined everything within her reach, on étagère and table, embraced the hebe in the corner, played a fantasia on the piano, and choked herself with the stopper of the odor bottle. A doleful wail betrayed her hiding place, and she now emerged with a pair of nutcrackers, ditto of pinched fingers, and an expression of great mental and bodily distress. Her woes vanished instantaneously, however, when the feast was announced, and she performed an unsteady passeul about the banquet, varied by skirmishes with her long nightgown, and darts at any unguarded viand that tempted her. No ordinary table service would suit the holders of this fireside fete. The corn was heaped in a bronze urn, the nuts in a graceful basket, the apples lay on a plate of curiously ancient china, and the water turned to wine through the medium of a purple flagon of bohemian glass. The reflection was spread upon the rug as on a flowery table, and all the lustres were lighted, filling the room with a festal glow. Prue would have held up her hands in dismay, like the benighted piece of excellence she was, but Mark would have enjoyed the picturesque group and sketched a mate to the golden wedding. For Moore, armed with the wooden fork, did the honours, Sylvia, leaning on her arm, dropped corn after corn into a baby's mouth that bird-like always gaped for more, and Tilly lay luxuriously between them, warming her little feet as she ate and babbled to the flames. The clock was on the stroke of eight, the revel at its height, when the door opened and a servant announced, "'Miss Dane and Mr. Warwick.' An impressive pause followed, broken by a crow from Tilly, who seized this propitious moment to bury one hand in the nuts and with the other capture the big red apple which had been denied her. The sound seemed to dissipate the blank surprise that had fallen on all parties, and brought both host and hostess to their feet, the former exclaiming heartily, "'Welcome, friends, to a modern Saturnalia and the bosom of the happy family!' "'I fear you did not expect me so late,' said Miss Dane. I was detained at the time, fixed upon, and gave it up. But Mr. Warwick came, and we set off together. Pray don't disturb yourselves, but let us enjoy the game with you. You and Adam are guests who never come too early or too late. We are playing children tonight, so just put yourselves back a dozen years and let us all be merry together. Sylvia, this our cousin Faith, here is your new kinswoman. Please love one another as little people are commanded to do. A short stir ensued while hands were shaken, wraps put off, and some degree of order restored to the room. Then they all sat down and began to talk, with well-bred oblivion of the short gown and long braids of her bashful-looking hostess. Miss Dane suggested and discussed various subjects of mutual interest while Sylvia tried to keep her eyes from wandering to the mirror opposite, which reflected the figures of her husband and his friend. Warwick sat erect in the easy chair, for he never lounged, and Moore, still supporting his character, was perched upon the arm, talking with boyish vivacity. Every sense being unwantonly alert, Sylvia found herself listening to both guests at once, and bearing her own part in one conversation so well that occasional lapses were only attributed to natural embarrassment. What she and Miss Dane said she never remembered. What the other pair talked of she never forgot. The first words she caught were her husband's. "'You see I have begun to live for myself, Adam.' "'I also see that it agrees with you excellently.' "'Better than with you, for you are not looking like your old self, though June made you happy, I hope.' "'If freedom is happiness, it did.' "'Are you still alone?' "'More so than ever.' Sylvia lost the next words, for a look showed her Moore's hand on Adam's shoulder, and that for the first time within her memory, Warwick did not meet his friend's glance with one as open, but bent his eyes upon the ground, while his hand went to and fro across his lips as if to steady them. It was a gesture she remembered well, for though self-control could keep the eye clear, the voice firm, that half-hidden mouth of his sometimes rebelled and grew tremulous as a woman's. The sight and the answer set her heart beating with the thought— why has he come? 
the repetition of a question by miss dane recalled her from a dangerous memory and when that friendly lady entered upon another long sentence to relieve her young hostess she heard moore say you have had too much solitude adam i am sure of it for no man can live long alone and not get the uncanny look you have what have you been at fighting the old fight with this unruly self of mine and getting ready for another tussle with the adversary in whatever shape he may appear and now you are come to your friend for the social solace which the haughtiest heart hungers for when most alone you shall have it stay with us adam and remember that whatever changes come to me my home is always yours i know it geoffrey i wanted to see your happiness before i go away again and should like to stay with you a day or so if you are sure that that she would like it moore laughed and pulled a lock of the brown mane as if to tease the lion into a display of the spirit he seemed to have lost how shy you are speaking of the new name she will like it i assure you for she makes my friends hers sylvia come here and tell adam he is welcome he dares to doubt it come and talk over old times while i do the same with faith she went trembling inwardly but outwardly composed for she took refuge in one of those commonplace acts which in such moments we gladly perform and bless in our secret souls she had often wondered where they would next meet and how she should comport herself at such a trying time she had never imagined that he would come in this way or that a hearth-brush would save her from the betrayal of emotion so it was however and an involuntary smile passed over her face as she managed to say quite naturally while brushing the nutshells tidily out of sight you know you are always welcome mr warwick adam's room as we call it is always ready and geoffrey was wishing for you only yesterday i am sure of his satisfaction at my coming can i be equally sure of yours may i ought i to stay he leaned forward as he spoke with an eager yet submissive look that sylvia dared not meet and in her anxiety to preserve her self-possession she forgot that to this listener every uttered word became a truth because his own were always so why not if you can bear our quiet life for we are darby and joan already though we do not look so to-night i acknowledge men seldom understand the subterfuges women instinctively use to conceal many a natural emotion which they are not strong enough to control not brave enough to confess to warwick sylvia seemed almost careless her words a frivolous answer to the real meaning of his question her smile one of tranquil welcome her manner wrought an instant change in him and when he spoke again he was the warwick of a year ago i hesitated mrs moore because i have sometimes heard young wives complain that their husbands friends were marplots and i have no desire to be one this speech delivered with a frosty gravity made sylvia as cool and quiet as itself she put her ally down looked full at warwick and said with a blending of dignity and cordiality which even the pinafore could not destroy please to consider yourself a specially invited guest now and always never hesitate but come and go as freely as you used to do for nothing need be changed between us three because two of us have one home to offer you thanks and now that the hearth is scrupulously clean may i offer you a chair the old keenness was in his eye the old firmness about the mouth the old satirical smile on his lips as warwick presented the seat with an inclination that to her seemed ironical she sat down but when she cast about her mind for some safe and easy topic to introduce every idea had fled even memory and fancy turned traitors not a lively sally could be found not a pleasant remembrance returned to help her and she sat dumb before the dreadful pause grew awkward however rescue came in the form of tilly nothing daunted by the severe simplicity of her attire she planted herself before warwick and shaking her hair out of her eyes stared at him with an inquiring glance and cheeks as red as her apple she seemed satisfied in a moment and climbing to his knee established herself there coolly taking possession of his watch 
and examining the brown beard curiously as it parted with the white flash of teeth when warwick smiled his warmest smile this recalls the night you fed the sparrow in your hand do you remember adam said sylvia looked and spoke like her old self again i seldom forget anything but pleasant as that hour was this is more to me for the bird flew away the baby stays and gives me what i need he wrapped the child closer in his arms leaned his dark head on the bright one and took the little feet into his hand with a fatherly look that caused tilly to pat his cheek and begin an animated recital of some nursery legend which ended in a sudden gape reminding sylvia that one of her guests was keeping late hours what comes next asked warwick now i lay me and bilo in the trib answered tilly stretching herself over his arm with a great yawn warwick kissed the rosy half-open mouth and seemed loath to part with the pious baby for he took the shawl sylvia brought and did up the drowsy bundle himself while so busied she stole a furtive glance at him having looked without seeing before thinner and browner but stronger than ever was the familiar face she saw yet neither sad nor stern for the grave gentleness which had been a fugitive expression before now seemed habitual this with the hand at the lips and the slow dropping of the eyes were the only tokens of the sharp experience he had been passing through born for conflict and endurance he seemed to have manfully accepted the sweet uses of adversity and grown the richer for his loss those who themselves are quick to suffer are also quick to see the marks of suffering in others that hasty scrutiny assured sylvia of all she had yearned to know yet wrung her heart with a pity the deeper for its impotence tilly's heavy head drooped between her bearer and the light as they left the room but in the dusky hall a few hot tears fell on the baby's hair and her new nurse lingered long after the baby was done when she reappeared the girlish dress was gone and she was madame moore again as her husband called her when she assumed her stately air all smiled at the change but he alone spoke of it i win the applause sylvia for i sustain my character to the end while you give up before the curtain falls you are not so good an actress as i thought you sylvia's smile was sadder than her tears as she briefly answered no i find i cannot be a child again end of chapter 14 recording by corinne lepage chapter 15 of moods by louisa may alcott this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Laura Riley. Moods by Louisa May Alcott. Chapter 15. Early and Late. One of Sylvia's first acts when she rose was most significant. She shook down her abundant hair, carefully arranged a part in thick curls over cheeks and forehead, gathered the rest into its usual coil, and said to herself as she surveyed her face half hidden in the shining cloud it looks very sentimental and i hate the weakness that drives me to it but it must be done because my face is such a traitor poor geoffrey he said i was no actress i am learning fast why every faculty seemed sharpened every object assumed an unwanted interest and that quiet hour possessed an excitement that made her own room and countenance look strange to her, she would not ask herself, as she paused on the threshold of the door to ascertain if her guests were stirring. Nothing was heard but the sound of regular footfalls on the walk before the door, and with an expression of relief she slowly went down. Moore was taking his morning walk bareheaded in the sun, Usually Sylvia ran to join him, but now she stood musing on the steps until he saw and came to her. As he offered the flower always ready for her, he said, smiling, Did the play last night so captivate you that you go back to the curls because you cannot keep the braids? 
a sillier whim than that, even. I am afraid of those two people, and as I am so quick to show my feelings in my face, I intend to hide behind this veil if I get shy or troubled. Did you think I could be so artful? Your craft amazes me, but, dearest child, you need not be afraid of Faith and Adam. Both already love you for my sake, and soon will for your own. Both are so much older that they can easily overlook any little shortcoming in consideration of your youth. Sylvia, I want to tell you something about Adam. I never spoke of it before, because, although no promise of silence was asked or given, I knew he considered it a confidence. Now that it is all over, I know that I may tell my wife, and she will help me comfort him. Tell on, Geoffrey, I hear you. Well, dear, when we went gypsying long ago, on the night you and Adam lost the boat, as I sat drying your boots and privately adoring them in spite of the mud, I made a discovery. Adam loved, was on some sort of probation, and would be married in June. He was slow to speak of it, but I understood, and last night, when I went to his room with him, I asked how he had fared. Sylvia, it would have made your heart ache to have seen his face, as he said in that brief way of his, Geoffrey, the woman I loved is married. Ask me nothing more. I never shall, but I know by the change I see in him that the love was very dear, the wound very deep. Poor Adam, how can we help him? Let him do as he likes. I will take him to his old haunts and busy him with my affairs till he forgets his own. In the evenings we will have Prue, Mark, and Jessie over here, will surround him with social influences, and make the last hours of the day the cheerfulest. Then he won't lie awake and think all night, as I suspect he has been doing of late. Sylvia, I should like to see that woman, though I could find it in my heart to hate her for her perfidy to such a man. Sylvia's head was bent, as if to inhale the sweetness of the flower she held, and all her husband saw was the bright hair blowing in the wind. I pity her for her loss as well as hate her. Now let us talk of something else, or my tell-tale face will betray that we have been talking of him when we meet Adam. They did so, and when Warwick put up his curtain, the first sight he saw was his friend walking with his young wife under the red-leaved maples in the sunshine. The look Moore had spoken of came into his eyes, darkening them with the shadow of despair. A moment it gloomed there, then passed, for honor said reproachfully to love, They are happy. Should not that content you? It shall, answered the master of both, as he dropped the curtain and turned away. In pursuance of his kindly plan, Moore took Adam out for a long tramp soon after breakfast, and Sylvia and Miss Dane sat down to sew. In the absence of the greater fear, Sylvia soon forgot the lesser one, and began to feel at ease to study her new relative and covet her esteem. Faith was past thirty, shapely and tall, with much natural dignity of carriage, and a face never beautiful, but always singularly attractive from its mild and earnest character. Looking at her, one felt assured that here was a right womanly woman, gentle, just, and true, possessed of a well-balanced mind, a self-reliant soul, and that fine gift which is so rare, the power of acting as a touchstone to all who approached, forcing them to rise or fall to their true level, unconscious of the test applied. Her presence was comfortable, her voice had motherly tones in it, her eyes a helpful look. Even the soft hue of her dress, the brown gloss of her hair, the graceful industry of her hands, had their attractive influence. Sylvia saw and felt these things with the quickness of her susceptible temperament, 
and found herself so warmed and won that soon it cost her an effort to withhold anything that tried or troubled her for faith was a born consoler and sylvia's heart was full however gloomy her day might have been she always brightened in the evening as naturally as moths begin to flutter when candles come on the evening of this day the friendly atmosphere about her and the excitement of warwick's presence so affected her that though the gaiety of girlhood was quite gone she looked as softly brilliant as some late flower that has gathered the summer to itself and gives it out again in the bloom and beauty of a single hour when tea was over for heroes and heroines must eat if they are to do anything worth the paper on which their triumphs and tribulations are recorded the women gathered about the library table, work in hand, as female tongues go easier when their fingers are occupied. Sylvia left Prue and Jessie to enjoy faith, and while she fabricated some trifle with scarlet silk and an ivory shuttle, she listened to the conversation of the gentlemen who roved about the room till a remark of Prue's brought the party together. Helen Chesterfield has run away from her husband in the most disgraceful manner. Mark and Moore drew near. Adam leaned on the chimney-piece, the workers paused, and having produced her sensation, Prue proceeded to gratify their curiosity as briefly as possible, for all knew the parties in question, and all waited anxiously to hear particulars. She married a Frenchman old enough to be her father, but very rich. She thought she loved him, but when she got tired of her fine establishment and the novelties of Paris, she found she did not and was miserable. Many of her new friends had lovers, so why should not she? And presently she began to amuse herself with this Louise Gustave Isidore Theodore de Rouville. There's a name for a Christian man, well, she began in play, grew in earnest, and when she could bear her domestic trouble no longer, she just ran away, ruining herself for this life, and really, I don't know, but for the next also. Poor soul, I always thought she was a fool, but upon my word I pity her, said Mark. Remember, she was very young, so far away from her mother, and with no real friend to warn and help her, and love is so sweet, no wonder she went. Sylvia, how can you excuse her in that way? She should have done her duty whether she loved the old gentleman or not, and kept her troubles to herself in a proper manner. You young girls think so much of love, so little of moral obligations, decorum, and the opinions of the world, you are not fit judges of the case." Mr. Warwick agrees with me, I am sure. Not in the least. Do you mean to say that Helen should have left her husband? Certainly, if she could not love him. Do you also mean to say that she did right to run off with that Gustave, Isidore, Theodule creature? By no means. It is worse than folly to attempt the righting of one wrong by the commission of another, then what in the world should she have done? She should have honestly decided which she loved, have frankly told the husband the mistake both had made, and demanded her liberty. If the lover was worthy, have openly married him and borne the world's censures. If not worthy, have stood alone, an honest woman in God's eyes, whatever the blind world might have thought." Prue was scandalized to the last degree, for with her marriage was more a law than a gospel, a law which ordained that a pair once yoked should abide by their bargain, be it good or ill, and preserve the proprieties in public, no matter how hot a hell their home might be, for them and for their children. What a dreadful state society would be in if your ideas were adopted, people would constantly be finding out that they were mismatched and go running about as if playing that game where everyone changes places. 
"'I'd rather die at once than live to see such a state of things as that,' said the worthy spinster. "'So would I, and recommend prevention rather than a dangerous cure.' "'I really should like to hear your views, Mr. Warwick, for you quite take my breath away.' Much to Sylvia's surprise, Adam appeared to like the subject, and placed his views at Prue's disposal with alacrity. I would begin at the beginning, and teach young people that marriage is not the only aim and end of life, yet would fit them for it, as for a sacrament too high and holy to be profaned by light word or thought. Show them how to be worthy of it, and how to wait for it. Give them a law of life both cheerful and sustaining, a law that shall keep them hopeful if single, sure that here or hereafter they will find that other self and be accepted by it. Happy if wedded, for their own integrity of heart will teach them to know the true God when he comes, and keep them loyal to the last. That is all very excellent and charming, but what are the poor souls to do who haven't been educated in this fine way? asked Prue. Unhappy marriages are the tragedies of our day, and will be, till we learn that there are truer laws to be obeyed than those custom sanctions, other obstacles than inequalities of fortune, rank, and age. Because two persons love, it is not always safe or wise for them to marry, nor need it necessarily wreck their peace to live apart. Often what seems the best affection of our hearts does more for us by being thwarted than if granted its fulfillment and prove a failure which embitters two lives instead of sweetening one. He paused there, but Prue wanted a clearer answer and turned to faith, sure that the woman would take her own view of the matter. Which of us is right, Miss Dane, in Helen's case? I cannot venture to judge the young lady, knowing so little of her character or the influences that have surrounded her, and believing that a certain divine example is best for us to follow at such times. I agree with Mr. Warwick, but not wholly, for his summary mode of adjustment would not be quite just nor right in all cases. If both find that they do not love, the sooner they part, the wiser. If one alone makes the discovery, the case is sadder still, and harder for either to decide. But as I speak from observation only, my opinions are of little worth. Of great worth, Miss Dane, for to women like yourself, observation often does the work of experience, and despite your modesty, I wait to hear the opinions. Warwick spoke, and spoke urgently for the effect of all this upon Sylvia was too absorbing a study to be relinquished yet. As he turned to her, Faith gave him an intelligent glance, and answered like one speaking with intention and to some secret but serious issue. You shall have them. Let us suppose that Helen was a woman possessed of a stronger character, a deeper nature, the husband a younger, nobler man the lover truly excellent, and above even counselling the step this pair have taken. In a case like that, the wife, having promised to guard another's happiness, should sincerely endeavour to do so, remembering that in making the joy of others we often find our own, and that having made so great a mistake the other should not bear all the loss." If there be a strong attachment on the husband's part, and he a man worthy of affection and respect, who has given himself confidingly, believing himself beloved by the woman he so loves, she should leave no effort unmade, no self-denial unexacted, till she has proved beyond all doubt that it is impossible to be a true wife. Then, and not till then, has she the right to dissolve the tie that has become a sin, because where no love lives, inevitable suffering and sorrow enter in, falling not only upon guilty parents, but the innocent children who may be given them. 
"'And the lover, what of him?' asked Adam, still intent upon his purpose, for though he looked steadily at Faith, he knew that Sylvia drove the shuttle in and out with a desperate industry that made her silence significant to him. "'I would have the lover suffer and wait, sure that, however it may fare with him, he will be the richer and the better for having known the joy and pain of love. Thank you. And to Mark's surprise, Warwick bowed gravely, and Miss Dane resumed her work with a preoccupied air. Well, for a confirmed celibate, it strikes me you take a remarkable interest in matrimony, said Mark. Or is it merely a base desire to speculate upon the tribulations of your fellow beings, and congratulate yourself upon your escape from them. Neither. I not only pity and long to alleviate them, but have a strong desire to share them, and the wish and purpose of my life for the last year has been to marry. Outspoken as Warwick was at all times and on all subjects, there was something in this avowal that touched those present, for with the words a quick rising light and warmth eliminated his whole countenance and the energy of his desire tuned his voice to a key which caused one heart to beat fast one pair of eyes to fill with sudden tears moore could not see his friend's face but he saw marks divined the indiscreet inquiry hovering on his lips and arrested it with a warning gesture a pause ensued during which each person made some mental comment on the last speech, and to several of the group that little moment was a memorable one. Remembering the lost love Warwick had confessed to him, Moore thought with friendliest regret, Poor Adam, he finds it impossible to forget. Reading the truth in the keen delight the instant brought her, Sylvia cried out within herself, Oh, Geoffrey, forgive me, for I love him. And Warwick whispered to that impetuous heart of his, Be still, we have ventured far enough. Prue spoke first, very much disturbed by having her prejudices and opinions opposed, and very anxious to prove herself in the right. Mark and Geoffrey look as if they agreed with Mr. Warwick in his, Excuse me if I say, dangerous ideas, but I fancy the personal application of them would change their minds. Now, Mark, just look at it. Suppose some one of Jessie's lovers should discover an affinity for her, and she for him. What would you do? Shoot him, or myself, or all three, and make a neat little tragedy of it. There is no getting a serious answer from you, and I wonder I ever try. Geoffrey, I put the case to you. If Sylvia should find she adored Julian Hayes, who fell sick when she was married, you know, and should inform you of that agreeable fact some fine day, should you think it quite reasonable and right to say, Go, my dear, I'm very sorry, but it can't be helped. The way in which Prue put the case made it impossible for her hearers not to laugh but Sylvia held her breath while waiting for her husband's answer. He was standing behind her chair and spoke with the smile still on his lips, too confident to harbor even a passing fancy. Perhaps I ought to be generous enough to do so, but not being a Jacques, with a convenient glacier to help me out of the predicament, I am afraid I should be hard to manage. I love but few." and those few are my world. So do not try me too hardly, Sylvia. I shall do my best, Geoffrey. She dropped her shuttle as she spoke, and, stooping to pick it up, down swept the long curls over either cheek. Thus, when she fell to work again, nothing of her face was visible but a glimpse of forehead, black lashes, and faintly smiling mouth. Moore led the conversation to other topics, and was soon deep in an art discussion with Mark and Miss Dane, while Prue and Jessie chatted away on that safe subject, dreaming.
dress. But Sylvia worked silently, and Warwick still leaned there watching the busy hand as if he saw something more than a pretty contrast between the white fingers and the scarlet silk. When the other guests had left, and Faith and himself had gone to their rooms, Warwick, bent on not passing another sleepless night full of unprofitable longings, went down again to get a book. The library was still lighted, and standing there alone he saw Sylvia, wearing an expression that startled him. Both hands pushed back and held her hair away, as if she scorned concealment from herself. Her eyes seemed fixed with a despairing glance on some invisible disturber of her peace. All the light and color that made her beautiful were gone, leaving her face worn and old, and the language of both countenance and attitude was that of one suddenly confronted with some hard fact, some heavy duty, that must be accepted and performed. This revelation lasted but a moment. Moore's step came down the hall, the hair fell, the anguish passed, and nothing but a wan and weary face remained. But Warwick had seen it, and as he stole away unperceived, he pressed his hands together, saying mournfully within himself, I was mistaken. God help us all. End of chapter 15